Hello and welcome to Life Questions. I am your host, Bill Harris. If you are looking for answers to the many complex questions about life, you have come to the right place. Life Questions is a program that looks at life's issues from a biblical vantage point to provide you with answers that are true to the Word of God. This week is part two of our special focus on young adults and youth. We've invited a panel of ministers to prayerfully review your inquiries and provide us with answers. And I'd, I'd like you to meet them right now. We have, first of all, Michael Green, who is student pastor at Lima Baptist Temple, followed by Zach Cars, director of student ministries at Cable Road Alliance Church. Then we have Bridget Blood, pastor of spiritual formation at Shawnee Alliance Church. And rounding off our panel is Ty Watson, youth and family pastor at Salina First, uh, First Church of God. We're happy to have you all with us today. It's good to be here. Now, I think that, you know, one of the things we need to talk about that's having a tremendous impact on young people today is, of course, social media. And it's having both a positive and negative effect. Some people are saying that, you know, social media is not good or bad. It, it just depends on how you use it. How do you find that social media is impacting your ministry and, and the young people that you serve? I mean, we gotta remember that social media is not going anywhere. It's, it's here to stay and it may look different two years from now, five years from now, um, but our students are always gonna be on social media. Our young adults are always gonna be on social media. And for me, it's, um, it's using it as an avenue to communicate. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't be crazy to say that the church would be have virtual services mm -hmm. 20 years from now that you could be in a virtual setting of a church and because that's just the way technology is headed yeah. and we have to as a church use that to our advantage yeah. um, actually this year one of my goals for our student ministry is to start a YouTube channel um, because I have students that spend a lot of time on YouTube and if they're gonna be spending on time on YouTube, then I want to create quality, co quality content mm -hmm. that they can be watching. And go where they are. Yeah, on you YouTube. go right where they are. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul mm -hmm. talks about being a Gentile to the Gentiles, a Jew to the Jews. You know, it's mm -hmm. like if we want to reach young people, we have to take advantage of social media. Yeah, there's a lot of unhealthy stuff on it. Um, there's a lot of things that you shouldn't be doing on social media. Um, you know, parents are, a lot of um, church parents are not for Snapchat. Um, but that's how our kids, that's where our kids are. And so we got to get on there. We got to go and we got to pursue them right where they're at. I think try, one, of the, one of the ways that is good to approach is understanding that we can have social media just like anything, but with boundaries. Uh -huh. And so um, I can't remember who said this, but one of the, I think it was a speaker that I follow on Instagram said, every week you should have at least one day off social media every week and one week off of social media every year. And then I know now like with the new, um, like iPhones that you can set timers that your mm. phone will shut off certain apps. So after, you know, whatever it is, after 8 p.m., those apps don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I like to do is my friends and I do what's called No Social Sunday. So every Sunday, I've t my phone only works for text messages, email, and phone calls. Um, but also like every week, I just was visiting my parents and I took the whole week off. I shut my phone off completely and just to have that time to reconnect. I think that's really important of like we can detox and we don't have to be slaves to it. And addressing the issue of it's not what can I get from social media, but it's what can I give? You know, people love to show pictures of their family or, you know, where they're on vacation or whatever it is. And those are good things, but it's not, a, oh, oh, let me fill this need because people also have that addiction to social media where it's a, I have to go on, I have to see how many likes I have, yeah. I have to see what I'm missing out on. Um, and so just being able to address those issues of like, why, are, why do you need to look at that? Why do you need to know who's at that party? Why do you need to know who, who's going here and doing that so that you can set good boundaries for it? Mm -hmm. Very good. I, th I think one of the issues that we see is, uh, you know, is you look at things like Instagram, uh, Facebook, Snapchat, uh, things that students are using or young adults are using, uh, you, you're seeing basically you're seeing everybody's highlight reel. You're mm -hmm. seeing the the posts that are that are great, the ones that they've spent time, uh, you know, taking a billion photos of and editing and getting just perfect, and then they post that, and then you get on social media and you see that and you're like, wow, their life is like so much better than mine, you know. <laughs> and and to you know to everybody else, everybody nobody's posting things on their bad days, you know. They're posting things about their trips and what right. they're doing, how great they look that day, and. Uh, when you, you know, if you're struggling with things like loneliness or, you know, insecurities about, 
you know, I'm not as good as this person or not as good looking as this person. And all you see is everybody's highlight reel. Even when you post something that you took so much time on, you're like, this, is a, this isn't a true representation of me. And, and I think ultimately, uh, social media is, is creating this thing where people are feeling more lonely than they are feeling social when, they're, when it's not, there's no healthy boundaries yeah. to it. Uh, because all you're looking at is the, the perfect things in people's lives and, and look comparing it to yours and saying, my life is far from perfect. <laughs> um, but, you know, and, and obviously we deal with that, you know, especially, uh, you know, towards the end of the millennial generation and the Gen Z. Uh, it's just increasing, just like Michael said. I mean, it's not going anywhere, you know, and so we have to be mindful of those things as we you know, continue to press on. I think all these things that have been said are right on. I know in my youth ministry specifically. Uh, I use a lot of social media platforms to connect with our young people. Uh, an incredible speaker, um, Nona Jones, she's awesome. She, she spoke recently that uh, used to, we used to door knock. Uh, now to door knock on the lives of young people, their front door is social media. And to be able to have those conversations with them, to know them, I do, I do hear where you're coming from. Uh, I think that it's so important that we understand that sometimes uh, a lot of a good thing can become a bad thing. When we start to believe that uh, we have to do certain things to be uh, externally significant, we start to become inwardly broken. And I think that's something that's really caused a huge dilemma in young people's lives today is the fact that, you know, talking about those highlight reels, those things that I want to be significant and people deem me important. Um, I think we just have to be careful with how we use social media today and how we portray that to our young people. Do you think it is a platform to offer a direct testimony or direct ministry to people? Oh yeah, definitely. And if so, how, in what ways? Yeah, yeah. You know, no when you're live streaming your Facebook service, right, you're live streaming your service on Facebook, mm -hmm. and you'll have, you know, 10 or 15 people watching or more, you know, for, for a community like this, that's a decent amount. And you'll have, you know, at least three or four commenting and being able to have those spiritual conversations. It's way easier for a student or for a young adult to slide into your DM than to actually come approach you and have a conversation. And you're, they're just opening up the door for us to get into their world and to go where they're at. You know, Paul talked about, don't make it hard for the Gentiles to come to Jesus. Yes, yes. You know, and, and we don't, we want to use social media as a tool of making it easy for our students to make that decision, to open that door for conversation. I think this is an excellent resource for churches to be using. I know that our church, last year we started a podcast called Tuesday Talks with Shawnee Alliance Church. And one of my um, guidelines for that is that no one would be called pastor. I wanted our pastor hat to be taken off. And we're having conversations that you're sitting with Bridget and whoever it is. It's real people sharing real stories and real struggles so that people know you're approachable. Because so often people are only interacting with us on Sunday or Wednesday whenever our like work is and they see us like these special people and we're not. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're Sometimes all... the title gets in the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so Definitely. just being able to share those conversations or like a YouTube, like YouTube is huge right now. Being able to share those real life conversations and say, no, like I have questions too. I'm processing my faith as well has been a really good way to connect parents with children as well because I have a lot of parents or a lot of students that will share episodes and say, hey, did you hear that episode? Let's talk about that now. And it gives parents resources to be able to talk with their children about topics that maybe they didn't know how to start without the episode. And in Revelations, you know, it says that we shall overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimonies. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important when we see testimony, just replace that with your story. Yeah. And when people hear your story, we see something incredible happen because no longer am, am I just looking at a church or I'm just looking at a place where people have service. I'm looking at real life, things that people have actually done in God in their life, God's done in their life. I think that's so important for us to understand that testimonies are huge and social media has become a big part of that. Yeah. Excellent. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you all, what about um, the fact that what you're doing is very supportive in your ministry with the parents who are of Christian uh, families, what they're teaching at home? Are they, one, are they aware that you're doing this? Two, is there a connection between the parents and your groups, and I know in your case it's young adults, so then you don't have parents that you're dealing with, but maybe you can at least give some perspective on that for us. But is there a connection, is there, is there a design and a connection so that they, the two of you work hand in hand? I, I, one of the things I try to tell my parents right away is that uh, the student ministry that we have uh, is a partnership. 
It's not, I'm not here to raise your kid. I'm not here to teach that. You know, a lot of, you know, a lot of times we get uh, parents that will drop off students and say like, okay, it's basically like a two hour babysitting service. Uh, And I try to make it clear, listen, no, I have your student uh, at youth group, you know, two hours on a Wednesday night, maybe a couple hours on a Sunday morning. You have them for the rest of the time. Obviously they're at school partially, but I I mean, I'm like, the amount of impact that I can make in a week is is so small compared to the amount sure. of impact that the the parents of these yeah. students are making and just how they live their life and so I something that I've been very poor at uh, but been trying to really get better at is communicating with the parents this is what we're talking about this month these are the questions that we're asking your students directly mm-hmm. uh, you know please go home and even if your your kid doesn't want to openly be like man youth group was awesome and we talked about this and this and that I'm equipping the parents and saying Here's what we're talking about. Start asking your kids about these things. See if they're really you know, paying attention, engaging, and then uh, trying to equip the parents with everything that I can so that they know how to do that well. Yeah. A successful youth ministry communicates to parents. Amen. They connect with parents. They're ministering to parents just as much as the students. And you know, this is something that I have not done a good job of. You know, I started out young, I started out single. Um, so for me, it was contact with the students, just students, students, students. And then I got married and had a kid and I'm like, oh, well, now I need help as a parent. And, you know, there's a lot of student pastors start out that way. They're single, they're young, they don't really know what it was like to be a parent. Um, so that's something that the Lord has been convicting me on is that a successful youth ministry is ministering to the parents just as much as the students. Very interesting. Very ministering to the parents as well as the students themselves. Yeah. I think Great you time. look on the flip side, you know, in our student ministry, it's a line of first. Eighty percent of our students' parents do not attend church on a Sunday or on a Wednesday. Um, that's a dynamic that we're trying to constantly evolve and figure out how can we touch base with those parents, how can we reach them. Um, I think it's incredible and I think it speaks volumes for the majority of my students that come because they have a desire for Jesus. I think more than anything they'd love for their parents to attend, mm-hmm. but I think as we grow, you know, we talk about statistics of young people that are are leaving the church. I think a lot of that is because we have so many parents that have lost their desire to know Jesus on a personal level. So how do we ignite that flame so that maybe they will uh, fall in love with him all over again and it won't just be their children that are coming on Wednesday nights, but they'd find that same desire too. So that's a really good topic. I know you're dealing with young adults, uh, so you don't deal that much with parents, but do you have any comments, do you have any perspective that you can add to the conversation? I think the shift that happens when you cross over from youth ministry to young adults is now you have adults that are now having conversation with their parents who are adults. <laughs> and so it's no longer parent to child, uh, yeah. it's adult to adult, um, family member to family member. And so that can be really difficult when we're processing through a lot of life hurts or soul issues and all of a sudden something pops up and go, oh, when that happened when I was however many years old, that really wasn't an appropriate situation for me to be in. And to be able to empower young adults to be able to go back to their parents and say, hey, now as an adult, what happened to me when I was 10 wasn't okay, and I love you, but we have to process through that. Mm-hmm. And that's very emotional and very hard. Yeah, I and so I think one of the big things, just giving people that safety net of, um, you're an adult now. Like you have ground, like you have the ability to show up with love and with respect and honor to your parents, but also realize that you can address the things that are unhealthy and change them for your legacy and your family. Very good. Well, we want to continue with more in a moment. In fact, I'd like to ask the question. Let's put this question on the table. Why is it that young adults are the largest group that are leaving the church in this day and time, according to one study? And we'll deal with that and more right after we take this break for some important information. We'll be right back. Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. We want to pick up where we left off on our conversation and uh, ask the question. Uh, the Barner study that we've been um, citing in this program and last week's program with you uh, has said that the largest block or the largest group of people leaving the church is young adults. 
you deal with young adults primarily. Can you give us some insight into why that's happening and how we can bring up a stopgap to that? Yeah. One of my favorite scriptures is, is in 2 Timothy 3. And so Paul lists this whole long list of sins that were going to be very prevalent in the last days. And the last part of that chunk says, uh, having a form of godliness, but, but denying, denying his power. power and so I know for me, like I, I became a Christian when I was 13. I was the first Christian in my household and knew, knew God, believed in Jesus, went to church. But when I was in college, I struggled with chronic illness really bad and couldn't get out of bed. I had professors that would pray over me. Um, and I called home one day and I said, Mom, I'm either going to drop out of college or commit suicide. I'm in too much pain. I can't do this anymore. And so I had a couple that committed to pray for me. Um, and one day we were in New York City and she, this woman prayed for me with two other gentlemen that were there. And the power of the Holy Spirit went from the top of my head and walked its way all the way through my body, out through my toes. And I took one step forward and every ounce of pain was gone. Wow. And it messed That's... up my theology so much <laughs> because I didn't know that Jesus still did miracles like mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. so for me, like having, having, that was a beginning encounter with God. But for me, when I'm working with young people, it's con continually pointing them back to Jesus is alive. He was powerful and he is very kind. Mm -hmm. And so bringing that back is you may have had a religious experience that showed you that God was not kind, but that's not the truth. The truth is that Jesus is alive. He's powerful and he's kind and he yeah. wants to offer that to us. Yeah. One of the questions we got in from viewers, for instance, said that um, they don't believe that God um, could be a God because of all the evil and all the pain and the suffering that is going on in this world today. And, you know, how, how do you address that question? People are leaving church because they, they look at the world, they see the way it's going and they throw their hands up and say, there can't be a God to allow this to go on. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things you can point at. And you know, growing up, you know, before the age of 11, I was sexually abused uh, by a family member. And then, you know, you talk about how the church treated me growing up. And then by the age of 13, joining my first gang, going to juvie at 15, and then going homeless for almost two years with eight different uh, eight different homes with six different families. Um, I think there's such what an a, adjustment that must have taken. Yeah, it, it was it was hard, and I think you look back at all those things, and you say, how could there be a God that could absolutely love me and allow me to go through all of these things? Uh, one thing I've noticed is that you know God is a faithful God, and He loves every one of His children. And as much as there's good, there's evil in this world. It's what makes everything make sense. And for me, I go back to when I was 15 and I spoke about it, you know, how I looked up at that second bunk and I said, God, if you could use anyone, you just use me. I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And I think that's where he meets us. And I wrote a book this past year called Hurt But Not Broken. And the way that I, the stories that I've heard uh, about how it's changed lives, particularly in a Utah prison, um, to a mother bought it for her two sons and they got a hold of it in prison and then it started spreading around in there. And, and, and I wanted to write a book, not for people to look at and say, wow, Ty's a good dude. You know, that's, that wasn't the hope. The hope was that mm -hmm. people could see that God takes our imperfect life and shows us that he has the perfect plan. And that despite our hurt, our pains, our failures, the way that we've been hurt by people, the church, and everything else, that God is still faithful, He is still good, He is still loving, and He still has a plan for every person's life. Mm -hmm. Very good. You, any you gentlemen want to add to that? Yeah, uh, I think about, um, you know, kind of going back and, and jumping into both of those questions of, you know, why young people are leaving the church. I, I think young adults today, they crave vulnerability. They crave realness. Um, I, I feel like, you know, the millennial generation and now, you know, Gen Z uh, get a lot of flack for being people who just don't care and are lazy and everything like that. It's just definitely not true. Uh, they, they care a lot about it. And it, it, thinking about uh, where I came from, I mean, I was an atheist until my junior year of high school. Um, I had lost my grandmother uh, and, and it just kind of destroyed me I, in fifth grade. And, uh, and, and I went through a season of depression and questioning and uh, I was like, you know, God can clearly not exist. And I went back to that question. I was like, if there's a God, how could he allow these things to happen? And it's interesting how your mindset changes when you're saying, if God is so just and so righteous, how could he ever allow me to go and spend eternal life with him in heaven? And when you start changing that mindset yeah. from how could God do this? It's like, well, yeah, how could God do this? Send a sinner, uh, you know, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, allow me to come to him and, and you know, uh, I think when, when young adults look in the church and, and they don't see that authentic vulnerability, they, they crave that. When we talked about social media earlier, there's, no, there's not a whole lot of authentic vulnerability there. Mm -hmm. um, 
but you know, I, I'm so thankful that I, you know, I got to be part of a, a body of believers in a church that uh, empowered me uh, and gave me a voice. And I think that's so important for young adults today is, uh, you know, to be able to be given that voice, to give that, uh, that you know, ability to go and to preach the word of God and to share experiences with people. And um, I think just people are craving that. And when they get that, they're like, oh, man, this feels so good to my soul. Mm-hmm. Do you want to add anything to that, or should? All right. You know, what I a common thread that I hear coming out of the conversation is, is making yourselves vulnerable to the young people that you're talking to, so that they see the flesh and blood in you. They're the first you know? people to detect when you're not being vulnerable yeah. with them. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're they way are. smarter than we give yeah. them credit for. <laughs> they can tell fake a million miles away. And they hate it, don't and they? And they hate it. Uh-huh. So I'm going to move on from that, right? Mm-hmm. And that's their identity. If they want to be involved in something, they're going to give their life to it. They need something to be real, and that's so important. Yeah. Goodness gracious, wow. Um, well, let, let's go on to the fact that um, in many cases, we're finding, uh, and, and parents uh, will allude to this, and I know we discussed this some on our last program, that everything they're teaching their kids at home in terms of moral values and the like is just snuffed out of them by the time they get to the college campus. And, and how, how we go about dealing with that without giving the child the impression that you're trying to deny them from having fun. That's, that's a tricky situation, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it's very tricky. I, I have a phrase that I use with our youth all the time because it was one that stuck with me uh, when I was 16. A man once told me, he said, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And Excellent. I will never forget it as long as I live. And so I tell our young people all the time, I can't be with them all the time. I'm not their parents. I'm not, and even parents aren't around them all the time. They've got to make decisions, but where are those decisions coming from? And what's the substance in their heart and in their soul for determining how they're going to react to certain uh, positions that life throws at them? I think it's so important that young people understand that they have a home at our church, in youth group, in young adults, you know, that they fit in, that they belong, and that the greatest circle that they can have, that circle of friends, can come from that place of uh, security, knowing that, you know, their friends aren't going to go out and do or make bad mistakes on a Friday night or a Saturday, but uh, instead they can, they can have people around them that they can trust, that they know it's going to work out for their good. Mm-hmm. And I think just understanding who Jesus is, that Jesus is fun and he's not holding anybody hostage. (laughs) Like we we can, we can go away anytime we want to, but when we've seen him and we've seen the fullness of who he is in equipping parents in your home, that when Jesus is fun and you can pray for people that you see at the grocery store or you get to, you know, whatever it is, go on like a God adventure with God, Mm -hmm. then God is fun and he is the pleasure and the portion and the prize Mm -hmm. so that the other things don't look attractive anymore. I know one one other thing that helped me coming along, and I got to say when I was 15, uh, but was the fact that they had special youth services on Wednesday night so that we could express ourselves and our our beliefs and we could even preach little sermonettes and things like that to to help us delve into the Word of God. That promoted growth. And I think this is something important for young people to do, is it? To to have a sense of their growth in their faith, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I like what he said earlier, you know, getting them involved. You know, there's one of the five faith catalysts is your personal ministry. And getting a student to do some type of ministry is going to bring them closer to God. When you, when, and, and sometimes it's uncomfortable. And sometimes you got to put the pressure on. Uh, but when that student has the opportunity to, maybe it's lead someone to the Lord. Maybe it's sing on the praise team on stage. Uh, whatever it is, you know, allowing them to serve in the areas that God has mm-hmm, gifted them. Mm-hmm. Majority of my tech team at church is high school students, and they love it. They, you know, that keeps that keeps them coming. That keeps them engaged. Yeah. You know, they they can tell me more about the message and the service behind the camera than they can tell me sitting in a pew. Yeah. So I played the guitar, and so that's what helped me because they let me play the guitar in church, and that, that, that kept me coming. What were you going to say? There, there's a difference between educating and transformation. And the church has done a really great job on educating young people and, and generations, but we have to become a church that's more transformative. Uh, instead of learning about how to lift weights in a gym, you have to actually do it to actually see progress. And so for young people especially, where is their purpose going to come from if we don't show the passion? And if they don't have the purpose for that passion, then it's never going to develop in the church for their lives the way that they need it to. Uh, I think it's so important that people don't just talk about, you know, 
ministry, but we're actually showing young people how their lives can fit in that ministry. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's pretty important. I, I love to add on to that because the, the thing is, you know, we talk so much about educating the next generation, but there's so much that the next generation has to teach us. Mm -hmm. And I, I hate uh, when, you know, when you ask me, why do we do it this way? Well, that's how we've always done it. <laughs> that doesn't work. And, I, you know, I, I always think uh, back to, you know, when you look at uh, younger generations, they're the ones that are coming out with the innovative stuff, you it's know, true. It's, it's, and people kind of perceive it as laziness, you know, like, well, why would we do it this way if we could do it this way? Well, we've always done it that way. But when you allow them to get innovative, when you allow them to get creative, you'll find, why are we doing it like this? Why are we not, you know, so it's like, uh -huh. you know, teaching and imparting wisdom and, uh, you know, showing them Jesus and everything like that. But God has uniquely created them to be creative, yeah. to think outside yeah. of ways that our generations, I mean, because every generation has kind of a general train of thought. Sure, sure. Uh, and, and the new generation does too, and they have so much to teach us. So when we lean into, hey, we should you know, start leaning into social media and virtual churches and things like mm -hmm. that, you know, older generations, including myself, because I get in the way of like, this is how we've done it. Uh, we can't snuff that out right away and no. say, hey, that, no. well, that's not how we do it because, man, Every every idea, everything that we've done, we do now was a new idea at some point. Yep. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so allowing the next generation to come in to take that ownership, they'll get so excited and passionate. Mm -hmm. Nothing is like crazier than watching a young adult get passionate about something. Oh, yeah. Nothing will stop them. Yeah. And so when we empower that and we encourage that, I, I mean, just sit back and watch God do miracles. Yeah. You know. Yeah, my entire youth group tomorrow night is going to be ran by former students that are in college now. They're back from break. You know, I had one of them say, hey, you, well, you want to let us run youth group? I said, sure. I'm like, and so they're already texting me with some creative ideas and, yeah. and what they want to do and what they're going to talk about. And you just see the zeal and the passion yeah. come from them when you empower them and allow them to do that. Give them the platform. That's it. it I, I guess what we're saying it, it takes more than ping pong tables and pool tables in the basement of the church yes. to yes. get them and to keep them, yes. doesn't it? Yes, yes. a lot Very more. Much. And you have a significant challenge. Do you, you let, let me just say this with all that's going on out there in this world that is attracting them and pulling them and pulling at them and pulling at them. Uh, do you ever get drained? Do you have, uh, as, you, as you're working out, we've only got about a minute left. I should have given you more time. <laughs> but do you ever get drained by what you're doing in trying to compete against the world? I only get drained when I start listening to the outside voices that take away from what's really significant. You know, like I spoke about before, when we start focusing on numbers more than we are the actual uh, issues at hand and what Jesus really cares about, and that's each individual heart and soul, then yeah, I can start to get drained. Mm -hmm. But the matter is at hand that it's all about the next one and those that are there for Jesus. Excellent. Well, on that note, we'll have to end it. We're just, we just uh, ran out of time. Thank you very much. I want to appreciate the, you know, the input that you've given us this week and last week as well. And you should go to, go to our website to look for last week's program if you missed it last week. Great uh, conversation here from this panel. And we're happy to have you with us today. And we want you to tune in again next week. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Bye-bye for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.